Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. These are the stories that set your agenda. Fed fear factor stocks pressured after a sharp sell-off on Wall Street as markets brace for a hawkish pivot from Powell. Most European markets are shut for May 1st Labor Day holidays. Amazon's AI boost shares in the e-commerce giant jump after reporting strong cloud unit sales on rising AI demand. Plus, Tesla's cost-cutting continues. Elon Musk axes most of the company's supercharger team, dealing a blow to other automakers tapping into the network of fast chargers. Let's check in on these markets then. It is Fed Day, of course, and expectations from Bloomberg Economics and others that you will get this hawkish pivot from Jay Powell. To what extent does he revise the view around three cuts this year that, of course, have been flagged by the dot pots, by the forecast, the most recent ones, of course, from the FOMC, in light of the inflation pressures that are persisting in the United States. So the language from Jay Powell, of course, is going to be very consequential indeed. Does he use the word less when it comes to the expectation around cuts? Does he even put the view that a hike is possible on the table? All of those different scenarios being weighed up by these markets, but certainly a hawkish pivot seems to be what is expected from Jay Powell at that Fed meeting later today. U.S. futures currently flat after the losses of 1.6% on the S&P yesterday. The worst drop we've seen since January. Yields up, the dollar strengthening. Again, the concern leading up to this meeting on the stickiness of inflation. U.S. futures, as I mentioned, currently flat. FTSE 100 futures flat. U.S. futures flat as well. The U.K., one of the few markets in this region that is open today, of course, the Labor Day holidays. Nasdaq futures pointing low by three-tenths of a percent, despite the decent numbers that came through from Amazon, with a particular focus, of course, on AWS, the web and the cloud part of the business with that AI component coming through. Cross-asset, let's flip the board then. The yield run-up, you had the two-year yield back above 5%, the dollar strengthening again, and that, of course, the wrecking ball of the US dollar continuing to concern and pressure many global FX and currencies, particularly in the Asian space. So two-year back above 5%, we continue to monitor that. In the oil space, you saw a drop in Brent prices of 1% yesterday. Inventories, the stockpiles building out in the US, but of course the focus as well on the talks around a potential, potential ceasefire in Gaza. And that all factoring into the oil space. Currently $85 a barrel, 63 on Brent, down eight tenths of a percent. Bitcoin as well had a terrible month last month, falling 16%, the biggest drop monthly since the collapse of FTX on that higher for longer expectation around the Fed. Euro dollar at 106, down a tenth of a percent, more reflecting the strength in the dollar rather than anything within the euro, at least for now. Let's cross over to the Asian markets then and check in with Avril Hong, standing by in Singapore. Avril. Yeah, Tom, we're seeing that risk aversion from Wall Street trickling through into the Asian session where many markets are shut. But we did see the likes of the Japanese, the Australian, New Zealand benchmarks at the start of trade, 1% down. They've mostly clung on to the losses from earlier on in the session. And the decliners today include the oil and coal producing related stocks. Uh, And this is as that geopolitical risk premium fades, helping to cap the declines on the Nikkei today. Today, though, special mention for the stock of LaserTech. This is the maker of chip making equipment and a reported strong order growth. We also saw an earnings beat surging by double digits. But let's flip the board because I did want to talk you through the performance of the Nikkei in the past month, where it lost momentum, it pulled away from the peak that we saw in March. Much of the run up in the Nikkei was thanks to the weakness of the Japanese currency. But in April, we did see losing momentum uh, because of this Fed pivot rethink and also because of that excessive pessimism towards Chinese stocks waning a little. So we're seeing the Nikkei today starting the month of May on the back foot. Let's flip the board and take a look at dollar yen as well because after Monday where Japanese officials are believed to have intervened, it has been stabilizing but now nudging back towards that 158 level and the moves seem to reinforce the idea that we will see potentially these multiple rounds of intervention continually to keep dollar yen in check uh, and of course as we turn our attention to the FOMC, that's really keeping traders on their toes, Tom. 
157.86 on dollar yen. Avra Hong, thank you very much indeed with the check on the Asian markets with the focus, of course, on the Nikkei as well and the currency around the yen. And the linkages to the Fed, talking of which the Fed, of course, is poised to keep interest rates on hold for a sixth consecutive meeting. A sixth consecutive meeting. Officials are also expected to signal that delays in future cuts could come amid sticky inflation, as I mentioned. Let's get more then with Bloomberg M Live's Ven Ram. Ven, set us up for what we can expect from the Fed. There's the statement and any potential changes to the language there. And then, of course, what we might hear, what we will hear from Jay Powell. Morning, Tom. Yes, uh, we are not going to get any summary of economic projections this time around, nor are we going to get a dot plot. So as you said, it's all going to be um, left to the statement and Powell signaling. Now, what is he likely to say? I mean, he is likely to be hawkish. In fact, he really has to be hawkish because he, he has no choice. At its March dot plot, the Fed penciled in a, a, a rate, inflation rate of 2.6% for the year, and that was already an upward revision. Now, it, this year, core PC is averaged 3%, which, is, which means that the inflation script has not quite gone according to their taste. So which means that the Fed has no choice but to be hawkish here. But much of that is already reflected in the front-end treasuries. If you look at the two-year treasuries, we have done 40 basis points in the past month. That's a humongous surge by any stretch of imagination. There is some upside potential for yields from here, probably to 522, but I don't expect that to happen immediately, Tom. OK, 522. And as you say, a lot priced in already, particularly to the front end. Talk to us about that reaction function within the Treasuries then. There's a relative ability for the Treasury markets to look through the hawkishness, given what's being priced in. And over a longer period, you do see that yield move higher at the front end. Talk to us about the Treasuries and the likely reaction to what we hear from the Fed. So, you know, as, 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 as we mentioned, you know, we've done 40 basis points in the past month. So the short positions may be encouraged to kind of take some money off the table because, you know, much of the hawkishness is already priced in. And, you know, I think that Powell is not going to comment uh, whether or not they will be able to get three rate cuts done this year because they still can technically do it. I mean, if they start in September, they've got three uh, meetings since September and they can get that done. It's unlikely that they, the plot will evolve that way, but theoretically, there's nothing that he should do today to kind of paint himself into a corner. He will leave that to the next dot plot. So, which means that short positions may be encouraged to take some money off the table, as I was saying. But if it comes to a pause that the Fed won't be able to cut rates at all, that's when we would see the two-year Treasury yield marching up to 522. Okay, so as long as that optionality is still there to cut at some point this year, then maybe there's a bit of a cap at the front end. But if not, then you could see further jumps higher in, in that year. 5%, just above 5% on the two year. And by the way, worth noting that Venram has been consistent in terms of the pushback in the early part of this year around expectations of, what, six cuts. And uh, uh, MLive's uh, Venram are uh, very clear on that at the front of the year that that was very unlikely. Uh, Ven, thank you for the analysis again as we lead up to that consequential decision from the Fed and the J-Power presser, of course. Now to the corporate story on the earnings front. The focus really was yesterday in the US on Amazon and the cloud unit coming through for that company once again, seeing the strongest sales growth in a year. It signals a turnaround for the retailer's most profitable division on an earnings call. CEO Andy Jacey said Amazon's AI capabilities are behind the acceleration in growth. Considerable momentum on the AI front, where we've accumulated a multi-billion dollar revenue run rate already. You've heard me talk about our approach before, and we continue to add capabilities at all three layers of the Gen AI stack. OK, for the deep dive on the Amazon story, then the earnings, of course, let's bring in Bloomberg's Charlie Wells. So, Charlie, the AI part of the business, particularly AWS, the, the AWS, the cloud unit, was always going to be scrutinized. Give us the detail around the success that Amazon has had with this and whether it's likely to be sustained. Yeah, Tom, so there was a really notable first yesterday. And so this was the first time that Amazon executives publicly put a revenue run rate on that AI franchise. And so CFO Brian Olsofsky said yesterday that this was a multi-billion dollar revenue run rate. And that is what Wall Street really had wanted. So AWS, they had a great first quarter. Revenue was up 17 percent. That's great. But what investors were really focused on was what are sales going to be like going forward? 
forward. 2024 was the year that a lot of these cloud companies needed to show that they could make money off of generative AI. And so that estimate, as vague as it is, was really important and part of that success story. Yeah, it's almost like they had the, the story around Meta in the back of their mind when they stressed that we are, we are monetizing this. We're investing, but yes, we are also monetizing. And as you say, investors seem to cling on to that in terms of the optimism. What, what about the rest of the business then, Charlie? How is that shaping up? Right, so Amazon's huge, right? And revenue overall was solid. It was up 13% from the same period last year. It was notable. I mean, this was the first earnings report where you saw, um, you know, Amazon Prime having ads. So ad revenue was actually up 24%. So there was a boost there. But what was really striking from this report was actually some softness in e-commerce. So actually sales there missed some analyst estimates. And, you know, Olsofsky yesterday, the CFO, said that consumers seem to be trading down. That could be a sign of inflation. And they also seem to be ordering more consumables. So these you know, need, need to be delivered a lot faster and that cut into some of the profit margins. Yeah, it's interesting what it tells us about the state of the U.S. consumer. You have the Starbucks miss as well. Well, and they're concerned about their, their customers and then, of course, what, what the e-commerce part of Amazon is seeing as well. Broadly, when you step back in terms of the AI story with tech, and I mentioned Meta and the impact that they had, of course, the stock selling off on the back of their spending plans. What is your assessment of where things stand right now in terms of the AI impulse for these companies? Well, with these mega cap tech companies, it was so about what the future holds. And so the street seemed to reward companies that could tell <clears throat> a more compelling future-oriented story. So I'm thinking more about uh, Alphabet's Google. I'm thinking about Microsoft. They were re rewarded when they could project a positive story out about generative AI. Meta's story, as you said, was more muddled, and they were punished because of that. So it's looking like Amazon falls into that former ca that first category um, where they were able to tell that positive uh, run rate story. Their shares in late trading were up about 2%, but let's see what happens when, uh, when stocks start trading. Charlie Wells, excellent breakdown of the Amazon earnings. Thank you very much indeed. And stay on, on the Magnificent 7, question marks as to whether or not this company should be in the Mag 7, which is Tesla. That company eliminating almost its entire supercharger organization. The group is responsible for building a vast network of public charging stations that virtually every major automaker is in the process of tapping into in the U.S. Bloomberg learning that the decision to cut the nearly 500-person team comes in addition to the more than 10% staff cut ordered in mid-April. Let's get the details then and bring in Bloomberg's Peter Verko. Uh, Peter, what does this tell us? What does it mean for the rollout of Tesla's supercharger network then? Yeah, good morning, Tom. Uh, well, clearly it's going to slow the, the rollout of the network. Uh, after news of the job cuts or, or the, you know, the whole division pretty much being wiped out broke, uh, Elon Musk posted on X that while Tesla will continue to expand the network, it's going to be at a much slower pace. Um, you know, Tesla's supercharger network, they've got more than 6,000 of these uh, superchargers in the US. It's seen as the most reliable, the most extensive and, and the fastest charging network in the US. And that's always been a big selling or big competitive advantage for Tesla. You know, it helps overcome range anxiety. It helps overcome, you know, concerns about how long it takes to, to charge an EV. And so to put some question marks over that, you know, again puts another bit of a, a cloud over, over Tesla and how fast it's growing. Uh, you know, charging's also mm. a, a, a money-spinning uh, unit for Tesla. Uh, analysts from Piper Sander uh, have estimated that it should be a $3 billion a year business by 2030. Um, so again, it just all looks like, as in other parts, this is all being pulled back a little bit. Yeah, indeed. And of course, this isn't just a Tesla story. There are the broader ramifications for the wider auto industry. Talk to us about about the ripple effects of this move. Yeah, and that's probably what's even more interesting. Uh, you know, Tesla's charging infrastructure has become the industry standard. So whereas GM and Ford and, and most other uh, big automakers in the US had their own system, they've all decided to transition to the, the Tesla system or the, or the Tesla network. Now, at the moment, that's being done by uh, selling adapters or uh, providing adapters to EV drivers from you know, Ford and GM and these companies. But from next year, they'll be installing Tesla's unique charging ports in their cars. Now, 
you know, this could have ramifications for the entire EV industry because, again, it comes back to charging infrastructure, it comes back to access to charging, and it comes back to range anxiety. And we know that those are some of the major hurdles in, uh, you know, stopping people making the transition from an ICE car to an EV. Um, uh, reporting that we had from the, from the US uh, last night when news of this broke was that executives at Rivian, which is, you know, one of the companies that's moving to the Tesla system uh, are confused and concerned by this development. Uh, we're heading into mm. summer in the US, which is peak driving period. And it looks like, you know, the, the major contact points for the you know, other automakers, uh, they've lost those at Tesla. And, you know, so there is going to be some uncertainty about how this all pa plays out now. OK, Bloomberg's Peter Verko on what seems to be another very consequential decision by the CEO of the tours of Tesla, Elon Musk. Peter, thank you very much indeed for breaking that story down for us. Coming up, questions linger over the resumption of ceasefire talks as Israel awaits a Hamas response. That conversation is next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Now, Israel will not join ceasefire talks unless Hamas responds to the latest proposal for a temporary truce and hostage release. That is according to the country's state-run Can News. For more on the conflict, our Emir News Director, Roz Matheson, joins me as well. And, of course, with a focus on those ceasefire talks. Uh, Roz, uh, Israel has presented a proposal. The US describes it and the UK as, as being extremely generous. When do we expect the Hamas response? Well, we are hearing the Hamas response may come as soon as later today. As you were saying, Israel says that they're not going to join those talks that have been going on, you know, mediated by countries including the US, Egypt, Qatar and others until they get that response and get time to look over it. Uh, as you were saying, the US and others, it described the Israeli proposal, the latest one, as, quote, extremely generous. They're saying it provides for the safe passage potentially of people to move back to the north of Gaza without being inspected by Israeli troops. Uh, there's possible some conversation around the withdrawal of Israeli troops from certain parts of Gaza. There's a lot, though, we still don't know about how long this ceasefire might last, particularly what might be involved in terms of the numbers of Israeli hostages that might be released, the numbers of Palestinian uh, and prisoners who might be exchanged in turn. And we just don't know how Hamas is going to respond. You know, either side has accused the other of never acting in good faith here. So there's no good word really between them at this point. And they're passing notes between uh, mediators to even communicate with each other. That said, there is an enormous amount of pressure coming from the US, from Europe, but also on Hamas, from Qatar, Egypt and others to get to the table and find a way to get a ceasefire because the imperative really is to get that truce to avoid Israel going into Rafah to invade Rafa in the south of Gaza. Yeah, and that is something that, again, Netanyahu has insisted he will and, and wants to do and that they will, they will eventually do. They need to do that in order, in, in order to bring this to a close, as, as Israel would see it. it give, given that, given what we've been hearing from Netanyahu, reiterating that, w would a ceasefire last? How, how tangible would it be? Well, that is always the risk that a ceasefire only lasts a week or two and then collapses again, or that Israel will only agree to a short-term ceasefire. Because as you were saying, Benjamin Netanyahu has been adamant about this, that Israel will still need to do more in Gaza to eradicate Hamas. And he says that's the ultimate goal, is to deal with Hamas. And so any ceasefire is going to be extremely fragile, even if it does happen. And Israel's unlikely to agree to an extent of what, of course, the hope of the others, the US, Europe and others, is that once you get a ceasefire, you can try and roll it over. You can, you, it's in place, so then you just try and get it extended. And the longer that goes on, the more you stave off Israel going into Rafa. But it's really clear that Benjamin Netanyahu is under extreme pressure at home, politically from the right and so on, to continue against Hamas. He's got to factor that in. And for all his comments right now, there's no indication that he's going to back down on his plans for Rafa. OK, Ros Matheson, thank you very much. Indeed, of course, bring us the latest on those ceasefire talks and, of course, what we've been hearing from the Israeli Prime Minister, who will be meeting, by the way, with the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, in Israel 
later today. Anthony Blinken is on the ground and will be meeting with the Israeli Prime Minister later on today is what we expect. So we'll keep across that story for you, of course, how that evolves. Meanwhile, New York police officers entered Columbia University's campus a few hours ago, arresting pro-Palestinian demonstrators who had barricaded themselves in a building. Colombia President Minou Shafiq said she asked police to clear all protest encampments and maintain a campus presence through at least May 17th. Switching focus and coming up, Novo Nordisk has become Europe's most valuable company and its home country of Denmark is feeling the effects. A fascinating deep dive into this story. We're going to bring you the details. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Now, there is no escaping the global phenomenon that the diabetes and obesity drugs Azempic and WeGovi have caused. The producer, Novo Nordisk, has become Europe's most valuable company and its home country of Denmark is feeling the effects. For more on this, our Copenhagen reporter, Sana Vas, joins us with the details. Sana has been reporting out a fantastic story, a sweeping story about the implications, the ramifications of this. Sana, how then is Novo's growth changing your home country, Denmark? A lot of ways. Uh, for one thing, Novo is the reason that Denmark's economy even grew in 2023. Uh, GDP was up almost 2%, but without Novo Nordisk, the economy would have stagnated. And then we're seeing a massive impact locally where Novo Nordisk is present. Uh, I went to Callan Ball recently, which is a manufacturing hub for Novo, and it's investing a lot of money into expanding its facilities there so it can produce more Osempig and more Wigobi. And you're really seeing the local economy there flourishing um, ed educational institutions are emerging around Norval. A lot of infrastructure is being built. Norval is creating a lot of jobs because they're hiring lots of people, but also we're seeing uh, jobs uh, via suppliers and construction workers. But even Danes who have nothing to do with Norval Nordisk will still have felt its, its gains. Um, probably Danes would have, have seen that their pension savings have, have grown thanks to Norval's share price mm. rising quite a bit. Um, and of course, Norval is also paying a lot of co corporate taxes, which is benefiting the, the average Dane. Yeah, it's re really fascinating. As you say, uh, ultimately, the, the growth picture of Denmark as well being reshaped by this to the, to the upside. So that's the positive, And those are a number of the positives coming through. But there are challenges, of course, and frictions as, uh, as well. What are those? Yes, there is. And especially for a very small country or a very small uh, economy like Denmark, uh, we are a nation of six million people. And we're hearing now that businesses are complaining that they're struggling to recruit because Norval is vacuuming the workforce. We've even seen armed um, forces um, losing officers to, to Novo Nordisk. Um, and then we're uh, seeing other concerns as well, for example, of, over the potential political favoritism of Norval, uh, which has a lot of close uh, ties to the government. Um, and there's a lot of political attentiveness to, to Norval at the moment. Um, and then finally, the, the size of, of Norval has also just triggered this question of, is it healthy for a, a small economy like Denmark to be so dependent on, on one single company for all its growth? OK, Sana Vess, with the reporting on the impacts of Novo Nordisk, its sheer size and scale on the country of Denmark. And it's well worth reading that story on the Bloomberg Terminal. It is today's Big Take and also, of course, on Bloomberg.com. Coming up, UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak faces another major test as England prepare for local elections. We're going to have a preview of Thursday's vote. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. These are the stories that set your agenda. 
Fed fear factor stocks pressured after a sharp sell-off on Wall Street as markets brace for a hawkish pivot from Powell. Most European markets are shut for May 1st Labor Day holidays. Amazon's AI boost. Shares in the e-commerce giant jump after reporting strong cloud unit sales on rising AI demand. Plus, Tesla's cost-cutting continues. Elon Musk axes most of the company's supercharger team, dealing a blow to other automakers tapping into the network of fast chargers. Let's check in on these markets, of course, with the context that it is Labor Day and many markets in Europe, major markets are closed. The UK, of course, will be open as usual, 8 a.m. UK time. The markets and the moves yesterday were pretty pronounced in terms of the fear factor, the caution rippling through these markets as we lead up to that Fed decision. FTSE 100 futures flat currently. You're seeing a little bit of pressure across the commodity space as well today. S&P futures pointing to the losses of a tenth of a percent. The S&P dropped 1.6 percent yesterday, the biggest one-day drop that we've seen since January. Nasdaq futures pointing low by three tenths of a percent, 17,512 despite the good news that came through from Amazon, at least when it comes to its cloud unit and the fact that the AI demand and drive is there. Let's flip the board and look cross asset then. U.S. Treasury yields continue to grind higher, above 5% on the two-year. That's the first time we've seen that level since around November of last year. So back above 5% from the two-year, again, leading up to what is expected to be that hawkish pivot from Jay Powell. At least that's the view of Bloomberg Economics. 106 on euro dollar. The dollar strengthening once again, currently down a tenth of percent, the euro versus the US dollar. Bitcoin has had a challenging, had a challenging April. It lost about 16 percent on the higher for longer expectations around the Fed. 59,000 right now on Bitcoin, up a tenth of percent. And Brent, $85.62 after a drop of one percent yesterday. The stockpiles building out in the US and the focus, of course, on those ceasefire talks around Gaza and Israel. Currently, Brent down eight tenths of a percent. To the Fed story then. The Fed poised to keep interest rates on hold for a sixth consecutive meeting for a preview then of what to expect, what to focus in on, what to be interested in and what to prioritise. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Carla Canivet for the details. Carla, what are you and the team going to be scrutinising when it comes to this decision? OK, so let's start with you, you basically nailed it. It's the higher for longer narrative. I think we, the last time we heard from Powell, he was very clear in indicating to the market that the whole uh, idea that we were going to see a cut from the Fed anytime soon is probably not on the cards anymore. So, and, and basically, if you look at the data that we've had uh, lately out, of, out into the market, there's not a lot for the, for the Fed to hang uh, a cut in. Sticky inflation, CPI is hot, PCE is hot, and even yesterday on the labor cost front, there clearly are some wage pressure. So, we are going to see, um, according to what the street sees, what mm -hmm. Bloomberg Economics, I think pretty much everyone thinks that there's going to be a hold. Now, the big question is, how hawkish is Powell exactly? And the, um, even though the Fed decision is the big thing, uh, the one that we always look for is, what are the comments after that? Mm -hmm. And will Powell indicate that there are less cuts on the cards for this year? And let's remember that we started off with three cuts for 2024 and right now people are thinking um are there any cuts for for 2024 so that calibration of does he indicate less does he indicate nothing um so looking at that will be very important and markets who also was looking at a three um interest rate cut for this year we're now looking at one, and there's a few more, more hawkish um, people out there who even mm. think that we won't see a cut from the Fed this year. Yeah, as you say, he's going to be in the hawkish gauge. That's the expectation. It's just yes. where that needle lands on, exactly. on, that, on that gauge, how red it gets. When it comes to the market reaction then, how much is priced in at this point in terms of those hawkish scenarios? I think a lot of it has been priced in, and what we've seen from the markets, they've, they've, the knee-jerk has been whatever data comes out, the expectation is that the Fed will, in fact, come back on the, on the rate cut scenario. So all of it has been a reaction to that. If you look at the positioning in markets right now, it's, we're, we're short bond. The world of the short bond is back. There's futures market, cash market. There's a lot of shorts riding on this. So I do think that the initial reaction will probably be the same that we've seen. But in the longer run... Once that um, data, once that those comments are digested, 
we might see some short covering, we might see some mm. profit taking. Because if like the market has been pretty hot. Yeah. So there might be some unwinding okay. of that. Interesting. So now short bonds are in vogue, but they we'll are. see how that adjusts, whether there's short covering on the back of this press conference. The press conference, of course, coming out 30 minutes after the statement. Carla, thank you very much indeed. A fantastic setup for a really important day once again for the Federal Reserve and Jay Powell. Bloomberg's Carla Canivet. Now to UK politics, where the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, is going to face another major test as England prepares for local elections. If dire polls translate to major losses for the Conservatives, MPs could push for a leadership change. Bloomberg's Alex Morgan has more. Rishi Sunak is facing another major test just months before an expected general election. Right-wing critics from within his own Conservative Party are gearing up to use Thursday's local votes as their final chance to oust him, as if dire poll ratings translate to heavy losses. Voting will take place for more than 2,600 seats in over 100 local authorities in England. That's in addition to 10 mayoral races, including in the capital, and a parliamentary by-election in Blackpool South. Now, Conservative eyes here in Westminster are going to be fixed on two results in particular, as the outcome of the mayoral race in the West Midlands and that in Tees Valley. Those areas are emblematic of the party's ability to perform in Labour-facing regions. Lose them both and Rishi Sunak could face a leadership challenge from within his own party. I think the best that the Conservatives can hope for is damage limitation. But certainly in, in recent polls that we've seen from the public's perspective, Ipsos polling shows that there's actually quite little appetite for another Conservative leadership change at this point. Labour will be keen to show that they can match sky-high expectations with results at the ballot box. The Prime Minister will want to emphasise that local elections are a very different beast to a general election. Whether that'll be enough to convince rebels within his own party, we'll find out once the votes are counted. OK, Bloomberg's Alex Morgan there on how the UK's local elections on Thursday could impact the general election later this year, for which we have yet to get a date, of course. Let's bring in at this point Bloomberg's UK correspondent Lizzie Burden for additional context on this story. Lead up to the vote then, the local elections and the mayoral elections, of course, tomorrow. When it comes to those constituencies, the council areas, the council constituencies, whether the battleground areas for the Conservatives, what are you going to be looking at? Well, there are two elements that will define success for the Conservatives in this. Alex put it well. They've, they've won just over 1,000 seats in the 2021 local elections. Can they hold on to about half of them, first of all? Secondly, can they hold on to two key Tory mayors, Andy Street in the West Midlands and Ben Houchen in Tees Valley? Because those two really represent the Conservatives' ability to fight in Labour-facing areas at the general election. Now, the latest uh, Ipsos... No, YouGov polling suggests that actually Houchen and Street will hold on at the next, at this local mm. election, uh, but it could still be a bloodbath on point one, the local council seat. OK, 500 out of 1,000 seems like a relatively low bar, but that's what they're going for in terms of above 500 being a success and the mayors, of course, keeping those. When it comes to the impacts and the ramifications for the opposition Labour Party mm. then, how are you thinking about that? Well, look, Sunak's failed to dent their poll lead. It's about 20 points at the moment. And even though Sunak's advisers keep telling us that last week was Sunak's best since he's been in number 10, the problem is he hasn't been able to sustain a positive news cycle in all of this time. Now, meanwhile, while Sunak's had this failure to launch, Starmer's actually just had another boost, the opposition Labour leader, because Humza Youssef, the first minister of Scotland, has just resigned. Now, that means that whereas Labour's had difficulty north of the border in 2015 and 2019 at the general elections, they've only had one seat, actually the SNP's a bit rudderless and the path to Downing Street through Scotland is looking a bit clearer. If tomorrow's a bad day for the Tories then, what does it mean for those, for those within his own party, the Prime Minister's own party, kind of gunning for, for new leadership? Yeah, because, of course, they've been plotting for months to use this as the opportunity to oust him. If this is the bloodbath that I said it could be, then they're going to use that as evidence that only a change of leader can save them at the general election. But there is a chance that Rishi Sunak gets hammered and still stays in number 10. They're going to need about 50 letters only from Tory MPs to trigger a no-confidence vote. So Sunak can't take his position for granted, and yet it could be a bad result and he manages to stay in. 
OK, Lizzie Burden setting us up very nicely indeed for those UK elections that start, of course, tomorrow. Lizzie Burden, our UK correspondent. The elections, of course, in England. Coming up, after the US adds sanctions to Russia and Iran, we take a look at the impacts and why they are so tricky to enforce and how corporates are adjusting to this thicket of additional sanctions. More on that. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Now, energy giant Total is increasingly making noise about moving its stock listing to New York. Speaking at a French Senate hearing on climate change, Total's CEO said the company was considering a move, quote, in part because ESG policies in Europe have more weight. It adds to chatter around European giants potentially being lured by US investors' greater enthusiasm for oil and gas Companies. So that's a story we continue to watch for you. We're checking on the oil markets, by the way, because there is pressure coming through across Brent and WTI. There was a drop of 1% on Brent yesterday. The stockpiles in the US, talking of the US, have been growing once again. But, of course, there's also the focus on the ceasefire talks, potential ceasefire, of course, in Gaza. And those talks, we know, continue. There is some modest and caveated optimism that maybe there will be progress there. So oil, Brent currently $85.64, down eight tenths of percent so far in the session. So building on the downside that we saw yesterday, WTI just holding above $81 a barrel, down nine tenths of a percent so far in the session. We stay on the energy space, particularly with a focus on sanctions. And then we'll also zero in on what's happening with tech, because Moscow is testing the limits of US sanctions on its tanker fleet, sending the first ship targeted by the Treasury Department with a cargo of crude to Asia. The tanker's journey comes days after the US eased some sanctions on Russian banks to facilitate energy deals. Let's get more then from Samosha Ferdinand, financial services lawyer for Ferdinand Law Group. Samosha, we'll also get your views on the Russia story, but we'll start with Iran because there have been some changes there. A law passed, of course, through the Senate, through the House, and then signed off by the US president. And there's a lot in, in that bill, including bite dance and including, of course, support for Ukraine, uh, Taiwan and others, Israel as well. But on the question of Iran and the additional sanctions that came through there, targeting, it seems, building on sanctions that already exist to target ports, for example, that take in Iranian oil. Talk to us about the consequences of those sanctions. So those sanctions have significantly impacted the ability for different corporates to facilitate or finance transactions related to Iranian petroleum or related to any other contact with any of the what we call foreign adversaries. So that is Iran, of course, but it also includes Russia, China and North Korea. What the bill has done is it has allowed the U.S. one to harmonize its sanctions with those of the U.K. and the E.U. So for those of us on the, this side of the pond, if we have stricter sanctions, the U.S. will harmonize with those sanctions. The U.S. has also, as you've mentioned, uh, focused on China and on Russia and making sure that with those sanctions, the U.S. is authorized to put those assets into a Ukraine support fund, hmm. for example, to support damages that you, the Ukraine may be I guess a key, a key question would be, we've seen time and time again, the ability of these countries, Iran and Russia in particular, to adjust to these sanctions regimes. And in fact, Iranian oil, most of it, which goes to China, 80% of its production That's goes right. to China. And That's in fact, right. it's at a six-month high in terms of production out of Iran, 3.3 million barrels a day. High levels of production coming from Iran, despite this thicket of sanctions. So how impactful are they in reality? Well, it's, it's true that the sanctions may make the behavior slightly slower or slightly more cumbersome, but they, it doesn't change the behavior, right? So the Russian tankers will change names and then change names back to see how that works. They will find a different route. They will go through other adversaries that are based in the Middle East. But I think what is important to also look at is how China is reacting in a different way to the same behavior. So what China has done when President Xi spoke with Blinken is he's talking about 
peaceful coexistence and how we can have a win-win cooperation with the U.S. So what we see is that the U.S. and China are both interested in stability, but the U.S. is focusing more on a narrative around national security, whereas China is focusing more on a narrative around economics and how mm. can we both work together in this. Yeah, and Secretary of State uh, Blinken, of course, when he was in China meeting with President Xi, also threatening China with, with additional sanctions on its companies that are supporting, he says, the U.S. claims, of course, supporting the industrial base of Russia and its defense industry. If those sanctions, and it remains an if, if those additional sanctions and checks come, in, come into place, is there an impact beyond companies within China? Is there a broader global impact of those potential sanctions? I think there is some impact of those sanctions, but I think that, again, those sanctions will always have workarounds. What is important for companies based in the U.S. to do is to make sure that they are not caught up in the web of those particular sanctions. So, for example, what this bill has also done is it has ex extended the statute of limitations from five years to ten years. So U.S. companies that are involved or have any touch points that can facilitate transactions, facilitate finance, lead to shipping with any of these contact points, they have to make sure that they have the right record keeping in place. They have to look at the reps and warranties in their contracts. They should think about their own due diligence when mm. they enter into these kinds of transactions because the long arm of the U.S. Um, extraterritoriality sanctions will come and impact those corporates. But for the others, I think it remains to be seen whether it simply slows them down. And we mentioned in our introduction to you that there have been some changes just in the last few days around the, the way that U.S. is thinking about the sanctions regime on particular Russian, Russian banks because they're concerned right. about a broader impact on the energy markets. Of course, we know the administration of Joe Biden is very acutely focused on, on gas prices, particularly in an election year, of course. That just speaks to the complexity of this issue. Compliance lawyers like you must be kept yes. very, very busy. This is, a is this the most challenging environment for corporates having to navigate this thicket of sanctions right now? You're absolutely right, Tom. It's very complex. It's very nuanced. We've seen U.S. CEOs go to Beijing to meet with President Xi at the same time that they also are well aware that in the U.S. they have to pay attention to how they have their compliance regimes in place, how they are making sure that they meet the estimates for this particular earnings season. So we see with Alphabet, we see with Microsoft, we see with the tech companies, how they're trying to dance between being available for China and the Chinese market. Mm -hmm. We've also seen Elon Musk with Tesla and trying to make sure that he is approved and has the right mapping systems that are allowed within the Chinese market. They're all trying to dance between what is necessary to do business in China and what is necessary to, to stay strong and respect the U.S. sanctions. Yeah, and we know that Elon Musk himself is a national security concern for some officials in the U.S., according to Bloomberg reporting. Samasha, thank you very much indeed for the analysis on this changing and evolving, of course, sanctions regime, the impacts, of course, in terms of the focus and the scrutiny on countries like Iran, Russia and China from the US. Samasha Fernandez, financial services lawyer from the Ferdinand Law Group. In other news on the earnings story, Starbucks shares sank in late trading after reporting its first drop in sales since 2020. The coffee house and roastery company saw transactions decline in every region over the second quarter. Starbucks cut its full year revenue growth forecast to low single digits and signalled adjusted earnings per share may be flat. Binance founder Chung Pang Zhao has been ordered to spend four months in a U.S. prison for failures that allowed cyber criminals and terrorist groups to freely trade on the world's largest cryptocurrency exchange. The sentence was far below the three years requested by prosecutors. It is the first time a CEO has been jailed for a Bank Secrecy Act violation. We can check in on the crypto markets right now, the focus on Bitcoin, less about the fortunes of Changpeng Zhao and more about the higher for longer narrative coming through from Fed officials, of course, and whether that gets cemented by Jay Powell later today. Higher interest rates generally not good for the crypto space. We're checking in on Bitcoin then currently at 59,900. And 50, a little bit of a gain, very, very modest for Bitcoin so far in the session, just up a tenth of a percent. It dropped around 16 percent in April, Bitcoin. It was a challenging month. That was the worst monthly jump, in fact, for Bitcoin since the collapse of FTX.
tax. And that's the price over 30 days, down 14%. Right, there is plenty more coming up. We're going to do another preview and a setup of what to expect, of course, from the Fed. We're also going to hear and listen in from the US Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen, on her concerns about the rising US deficit. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. do have concern about where we're going unless we undertake some significant steps to reduce the budget deficit. That, of course, was the U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen testifying at a House Ways and Mies committee hearing, talking about her concerns about the run-up in public debt in the deficit, of course, the U.S. And wow, what a move that has been. Look at this chart. It tells you and shows you exactly where we are in terms of the debt pile of the United States. 34.6 trillion, almost 35 trillion U.S. dollars. Cast your eye back 20 years to 2004 and you are well below 10 trillion. So from 10 trillion in 20 years to almost 35 trillion trillion US dollars. Let's flip the chart and see where this leads us and kind of the here and now and the challenges of the Treasury in terms of refunding. They came out, by the way, with their needs, their most up-to-date estimates in terms of the additional needs coming in with about 243 billion. That was above the estimates of some. They got their refunding, quarterly refunding announcements going to come through later today. So that's important in terms of the notes and bonds that they plan to issue. And the trajectory has been high in terms of the sizes of those auctions. And, of course, the question has been to what extent the market can absorb and has the appetite for those auctions. So far, that market has been able to absorb the issuance. But how long and to what extent does that continue, of course? This is the monthly issuance of notes and bonds. And as you can see, the trajectory has been higher. So the quarterly refunding announcement will come out from the Treasury later today. Part of it, of course, will be linked to the... QT decision from the Fed. The expectation is that possibly they start to slow the pace of quantitative tightening as soon as today with that meeting. Let's flip the board and have a look then in terms of when and to what extent the SMP performs in a context of higher rates. We're talking about QT, but we're also of course, talking about a Fed that is likely to hold for longer, a sixth consecutive decision where rates are expected to be held at around that 5.25% level. But maybe fear not too much, because in history, going back to 1999, the S&P has actually outperformed in a scenario where rates are hold at a low rate, at a high rate, between 13 to 17 percent. In fact, they underperform when rates are cut as much as 17 percent. So that's the context on a one day move going back to 1999. Just thinking about that as we lead up, of course, to that consequential Fed decision, the language from Jay Powell in focus, just how hawkish will he be? The analysis and the preview of that will be coming up as well. Markets today is next. This is Bloomberg.